and worked as a clinical PA in the cardiology division and administrator for the Duke Cardiology Associates and manager for the congestive heart failure research service group. She then directed cardiology site-based research coordination where she managed 22 study coordinators for 50 to 60 ongoing studies. She was then appointed director of site-based research at the Duke Clinical Research Institute and in 2005 was appointed to a faculty position as associate chair, vice chair for clinical research in the Department of Medicine at Duke University. She is currently a clinical assistant professor of medicine at Stanford University and consulting to the dean of the School of Medicine to transition the PA program to a master's granting degree program. And it has now been approved by the faculty senate and is accepting applications. Thanks for coming. Thank you. That introduction shows my age because we never call it congestive heart failure anymore. So we'll go into that. But, um, could we just take a minute to, because it's easier and better for me to talk to the audience knowing who I'm talking to and how I'm going to go into some details. So why are you interested in this heart failure talk? Could we just go around and introduce who you are? We can start with you. Do you mind? My name is Nikki Santanese, and I am a clinical research coordinator for the GI group. For GI? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, I'm talking to me now. Okay, cool. It's fine. It's better to laugh. Okay. Uh, um, I'm a project manager with uh, 
much to heart failure and please let's have some open dialogue back and forth. I hope this is helpful to you. I'm very passionate about <coughs> heart failure. I've treated these patients for close to 30 years. I, I really find that uh, this is a different cohort of patients to where uh, it's, a, it's a devastating diagnosis because 50% of the people that are diagnosed with heart failure will be dead in five years. And if you're diagnosed with a class four heart failure, 50% of those patients will be deceased within a year. So it's really a devastating uh, diagnosis and you become very close to these patients because they need constant and very intimate uh, management of their fluid status, et cetera. So we'll go over the definition of heart failure, the classification, epidemiology of it, pathophysiology, what symptoms you'll see upon evaluation, classification of the evidence, and then some treatments. So heart failure is, is a diagnosis of, it's a clinical syndrome. It's signs and symptoms of what patients report to. And it's abnormalities in the heart structure and function. So the heart is not able to pump as it should. And we'll talk about different types of heart failure. But what happens when the heart becomes weakened and it's not pushing your fluid forward, the heart is a pump. It's a right-sided and a left-sided pump, so think of it as a pump. So if the heart is not pumping, fluid then begins to back up. So it backs up from the left side into the lungs and then into the right side of the heart and then your liver and others. So it's just, it's just a pumping system all the way back. So if it's not pumping fluid forward and it starts to get congestion uh, in the lungs, you'll, patients will report some shortness of breath, but they'll also be retaining some fluid because the heart is not pumping fluid forward. And they can get tired, they can get fatigued, they have adverse events such as because their blood is being shunted to different areas, they're not hungry, so they don't eat much. So you'll see a lot of these type of symptoms. But even though we get congestion when you have left-sided failure and fluid goes into the lungs, we really call it heart failure now because there's a lot of other heart failures that don't have congestion, which we'll talk about. So now we talk more about heart failure and not congestive heart failure. So there's ways to classify heart failure, ejection fraction. For those that are in cardiology, we'll know what that term means. For those that aren't in cardiology, you may not. But it's the proportion or fraction of blood that's ejected forward with each systolic contraction. So can you throw out some numbers what you think a normal ejection fraction is? What's a normal? Those of you, you can. 55, 60. So normal is anything, yeah, above 50%. So your heart is not, it doesn't empty the chamber when it contracts, but about 50% or more blood that is ejected out is normal. So when you see an ejection fraction of 30%, 40%, th those are the um, heart failure ejection fractions. So we also classify them in New York Heart Association. How symptomatic are these patients? Are they mildly symptomatic or are they severely symptomatic? And we'll go through those. And then uh, um, stages of heart failure as well. So this is a cross-section of the heart. This is your normal heart cross-section. You can see that the left ventricle is thicker and ma more massive than the right ventricle, and that's because the heart is a muscle. And the left ventricle is what's pumping blood to the rest of the body, so it really has to contract and be thicker, and it's always gonna be thicker than the right ventricle, which the right ventricle is pumping blood just a short distance into the lungs. But when you get heart failure, you can have, and these are new, when, when I was in school and walked uphill 30 years ago with no shoes and back home, the old story. We didn't, these terms were not around. We didn't, they were, it was, it was congestive heart failure. But now there's been so much study on heart failure that now it's been classified into um, HEFREF and HEFPEF. So we'll go through these. So HEFREF is reduced ejection fraction. But if you look at this, you can see that the heart is actually quite enlarged from this. It's big. The walls are thin. So this is systolic heart failure. So the heart becomes boggy and it just doesn't contract. It just kind of barely moves. You may see different wall motion abnormalities, like the, the anterior part of the heart doesn't pump. Or you can see a global that just the whole heart just kind of just doesn't move. But in this one, it's preserved 
uh, ejection fraction to where their ejection fractions are normal. They're greater than 50%, and this is much less. But can you see how this becomes really hypertrophy, really thick? And so the symptoms of systolic ejection fraction or systolic heart failure and diastolic heart failure, preserved ejection fractions are also known as diastolic heart failure. And it's important that we diagnose this correctly because the treatment options are actually quite different and actually quite dangerous if you're treating one incorrectly. Um, but the symptoms are very similar because you can see that cardiac output, your cardiac output is gonna be high because you've got a thick wall motion that's pushing the blood out, but it may be low because the chamber becomes so encroached that you really can't fill. You don't get much blood in there, so you're ejecting out a lot of what you have, but you never really have good filling. Does that make sense? Do you guys understand that? because it's a really important thing as we go forward. So this, cardi this cardiac output is actually gonna be very low. You have high filling pressures, and the heart is just barely pumping, so it's just a little bit of blood that goes forward. And we're gonna talk about treatment mechanisms for this <laughs> after load and preload. So this is an important thing to understand, and a new diagnosis, a, a new classification um, over the last decade or so. So I'm going to play just a little, we're going to go back and forth with this. I'm going to sh I want you to just look at this. Many of you may not know, or under, it's not important that you know what we're looking at. This is, I mean, what aspects of the heart we're looking at. It is a heart. It's important you know it's a heart. Um, and you have valve leaflets here. But I want to go back and forth. And I want you to just try, this is a second one. in these wall motions? Let's talk about them for a minute. Can anyone jump in and you tell me what you see here? Less regular, less contraction. Yeah, and, and the walls are kind of thin, and it's not moving well. Right? And this one, look how thick. And it's contracting. I mean, you can see it moving. So those are the difference with ultrasound that we're really looking at. So a patient comes in and they're short of breath and they've got hitting edema and they're just fatigued and you're trying to understand what, what's going on so we can get ultrasounds. Now this is showing extreme, so it makes it easy to teach, but there's a lot of gray area and we'll talk about that. What if you have an ejection fraction of 45? and they have these symptoms. Is it systolic heart failure? Is it diastolic? We'll go into that. So the New York Heart Association looks at heart failure as asymptomatic. I, can, I, I may have evidence of heart failure on an ultrasound or shows your EF, but I can do my activities of daily living. I can go to work, I can make my bed, I can get myself dressed. And then it moves down the scale. So when you have more moderate symptoms or uh, with minimal exertion, and then the class four is at rest. So you just sit in the chair and couch, and you just get short of breath. And maybe this one's you. You can do air activities in the morning, but you are kind of tired. And this one's you're starting to get tired, like walking up a flight of stairs. You've got to stop and take some breath. So this is how we classify heart failure patients with the New York Heart Association, based on how symptomatic they are. So we also, with the guidelines of the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, we look at stages of heart failure. So if a person has high risk, they're a diabetic, that's going to put them at risk, or previous known heart attack and coronary artery disease, they're at risk for heart failure because you're damaging that heart muscle. But you may also, so it, class B is when you've had structural heart disease, you've actually had an MI, showing ST segment elevation. For those of you who've taken the EKG class, ST segment elevation, tombstone looking. 
Um, and you have structural heart disease, again, showing that you have either then wall motion or wall motion abnormality from myocytes or heart muscle that's been killed off from a uh, heart attack. Uh, again, if you're more symptomatic, you start to move into stage C. If you're symptomatic, you're short of breath, you're tired. And then refractory end stage, when we're looking at palliative care on how to take care of patients, and these are LVADs, usually generally um, bridging uh, mechanisms both for heart transplant. How many in here are organ donors? We need hearts, so, <laughs> so many people we'll need an organ this. donor. So many people die because they don't get hearts. There's an enormous amount, so I'm really uh, strong, feel very passionate about that. It's not gonna do you any good if you're gone. So uh, we really do, and there's no other uh, mechanism to help these patients, so. And organ being an donors. organ donor on your license is not enough. You have to go on, I. I'm also passionate about this. You have to go into donatelife.net and actually sign up through the organ donation system there. You can't just say I'm your license, I'm an organ donor. So that's and another you have step. to tell your family that you right. need it. Right. Important, important side note. Sorry, we're late. Oh, no worry. So this is just another um, uh, illustration on heart failure, again, showing the classifications of EF less than 40% here of systolic heart failure. We'll talk about some randomized clinical trials. I'm a clinical trialist, so I really believe in evidence-based medicine. I'm passionate about clinical research. We only know how to treat patients better today by participation and what all of you do in research is, is so important. And you know, never forget that these patients are willing their bodies to science. And I, I think that's a, a real gift that our, our subjects and patients give us. And then we have, again, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction greater than 50% <coughs> we talked about. But again, I told you, it's the art of medicine, it's not the science of medicine. Um, medicine's not always that easy, and there's a lot of gray areas in how do we treat patients that have symptoms of systolic heart failure, but their EFs are in this gray area. And then you can have some that have had systolic, but then improve. So, these are some classifications by uh, the American Heart Association. Again, this is just another illustration of what we just uh, spoke about with the different classes and stages, but it just helps you define it and become more specific and detailed in your... Now, this is a very busy slide, and I, I show it just because it gives you algorithms, and in medicine, when you have algorithms that help you with treatments or decision trees, that makes it easier on treating patients when it's a little bit more black and white. So here you have a patient that has maybe diabetes and they're in stage A, so they're at risk, but they don't have, they don't have symptoms of it. So what you wanna do is you wanna put them on therapies of obviously their diet for their diabetes, but it's preventative um, therapies, but then drug therapy. ACE inhibitors have been shown to be beneficial. They're very important in patients who are at risk for heart failure but also very important uh, mechanisms for patients with diabetes because it helps with blood flow to their kidneys because they get that microvascular disease. <laughs> so um, therapies such as ACE inhibitors become very important. But then as you move into stage B and you start to get structural heart disease with a previous MI, um, you have LV remodeling from that, those goals of therapy are gonna be slightly different if they've had coronary artery disease. Again, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, um, angiotensin receptor blockers, uh, those are also helpful. ACE inhibitors, many patients have side effect profile of cough. Uh, they're, they've been shown to improve survival in patients with heart failure. They're just so important uh, to have, but many patients can't tolerate them and ARBs are a good uh, substitute. Beta blockers, mainstay of therapy for patients with heart failure, uh, with uh, MI. It's very important that patients are on an aspirin and a beta blocker. Those will improve survival alone for patients who have had heart attacks. So again, this just takes you through this algorithm. Stage C, you're getting into um, more extensive heart failure. Again, you have this algorithm of preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction. And when you have obvious EF classifications of 50 or 60 or 70 percent, that becomes an easier diagnosis on what you do and how you treat those patients. The systolic, um, there's been a lot more trials 
and systolic dysfunction of patients. So the evidence is much stronger for those, and we don't know how to really treat patients with diastolic heart failure very well. But the important thing to know is patients that have systolic heart failure, things that help uh, with, their, with their symptoms, are certainly going to be diuretics. You want to get that fluid off when they get congested and full and have edema. So diuretics are going to be a mainstay of therapy just for quality of life and their breathing and their <laughs> symptoms. ACE inhibitors we know have been shown to improve survival. Now when I was in PA school, you, it was contraindicated for patients with heart failure to get beta blockers. And let's think about that. It makes sense, right? So the heart's already in a weakened state. <coughs> it's already working so hard. Why would you give a beta blocker that has negative inotropic properties? It blocks the beta-1 receptor. Beta-1 receptors are in the heart. Why would you give a patient a beta blocker when the heart is already weakened? But there were some studies over in Europe, and this gentleman kept saying that this makes sense because it decreases the workload, it decreases oxygen consumption. So we did a lot of trials, and I was actually very fortunate to participate in one of the original trials with beta blockers. And, and now, beta blockers are a mainstay of therapy. They're, the, they're one of the main lines that you treat. So it's, it's pretty exciting during your lifetime as treating patients that you can see something really changed from this was a negative thing to do and now the data shows it's a positive thing to do and patients really should be on beta blockers with heart failure. But there's beta blockers and you start very, very low doses. If you slam them with atenolol or metoprolol, 25, 50 milligrams, that is gonna put them in severe heart failure. So you're starting with ACE inhibitors such as patopril and allopril and you're starting at 3.25 or 6.25 milligram doses. You see them every couple of weeks, you tell them they're gonna feel bad. They're gonna feel bad for a couple of weeks, push through, and it's gonna get better. And I'll tell you my, my on a personal note, um, I am very passionate about heart failure, but my father had had his first MI when he was 38 years old. <laughs> he had his second MI when he was 44, and he had his third at 50, and then had five, five vessel bypass surgery. His father, uh, died right before I was born, so I never got to meet him um, at 50 of a heart attack. So we have a very strong family history of heart disease. And um, he, was, he was doing well. Uh, he, he was a dean at a university, very well educated in, um, in Mississippi. And of course, heart failure, he knew, was, was what I really worked with my patients and told me that you know, he wasn't feeling well. Um, he, he didn't feel like his doctors were really helping him, so I asked him to send me his records. And he sent me um, a piece of paper that had a, a, a MUGA scan during that time, which is a type of imaging. It's a nuclear, nuclear medicine, but it's a multi-unit gated acquisition to where you look at the heart over a number of beats. And uh, his EF was 17%. So that was pretty shocking for me to be in heart failure. And you see someone you love, and you get this piece of paper, and their EFs are so low. So we brought him to do... Um, he was, incidentally, we did an exam on him and we found that he had a triple A and his heart was so weak and he was in such bad shape we couldn't repair the triple A because he <laughs> probably wouldn't have made it through the surgery. But he was on, in the small town in Mississippi, he was on every drug we knew would kill him. Antiarrhythmic therapies, which he didn't need, which have proarrhythmic uh, qualities. He was on nothing that we knew at that time, we knew would improve his lifetime, his survival, and he was on none of those. So we changed his meds, and we actually in, and got his heart in much better shape. He came back three months later. We started with the beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, everything we knew would help him. He came back three months later, uh, had the AAA bypass uh, fixed, and lived for uh, a few more years. So. So this, this is a, a personal to me, and I, it means a lot that you are, as research coordinators, gathering this evidence that's changing lives of patients we treat. So the prevalence of heart failure, we have five million Americans that have heart failure. You can see men, because coronary artery disease is the number one reason why you see heart failure in this country. There's many other reasons, but ischemic coronary disease is the number one reason. And women are protected in the early years because of our hormone therapy, estrogens, 
but as we go through menopause, that starts to change, and actually 80 and above women start to bypass men in the number of, that have heart failure. There's 825,000 new cases of heart failure diagnosed, so when you're in the hospital and you're on primary care, gen med, you're seeing this a lot. And by two, uh, 2030, we'll be seeing about eight million people with heart failure. And you know, my husband's an interventional cardiologist, and, I, and we've gotten so much better at treating patients who have myocardial infarction. Many of them used to not even make it to the hospital. But um, now they make it to the hospital, they get their stents, they're, but I said, then they pass them on to the heart failure specialist. And that's why we've done so much better at treating patients with heart attack or getting them to live longer, but then they're starting to live longer with, with heart failure and um, different quality of life that we have to, have to work on. So it's the leading cause of hospitalization in patients 65 years and, and older. And the outcomes is, you will see that even insurance, I'm sure cardiology hears this all the time, but our payments for our insurance now, because our, our government recognizes that this is such a huge problem in our country, that they're trying to get not only practitioners and clinicians to practice evidence-based medicine and do the right thing, but now your payments are tied to how well you're doing. So there's a really high readmission rate for patients who are discharged from heart failure. You can see about 23% um, for readmission of all cause readmission after they're discharged from the hospital. So the tie to payment is you're trying to get patients out between this 30 days. And you can see at 100, they have numerous hospitalizations due to fluid overload symptoms. But our payments are tied to getting these numbers down. So if you have patients that are discharged from the hospital and they're not readmitted back within 30 days, our payment system is better. That's a big incentive. <laughs> it's a big incentive for hospitals to do the right thing and make sure their practitioners are practicing evidence-based medicine. So one in nine death certificates mention heart failure in some form of another in this country. And this is what I said earlier, that it has a really, really high mortality rate. And again, if you're diagnosed with class four heart failure, 50% of those patients will be deceased within a year. So this is what the government is looking at. Our, we spend over $39 billion just in this disease alone. And most of that is for hospitalization, but you can certainly see where there's a huge number of drugs. And the average number, I think, of drugs that these patients are on during um, treatment, they can be on to 10 different drugs a day with uh, heart failure. So you can imagine when you're 70 and 80 years old, <laughs> and you're trying to manage all these different drugs and doses and times of day because of, you, know, you want to make sure that you try and get your diuretics in the morning because if you do them in the evening, then you're up all night peeing and sometimes people do need them twice a day, so you want to give them a little earlier. So you're working with them on these balances of, um, of, their, of their quality of life and daily activities. The cost is beginning, is continuing to just skyrocket. Uh, Paul Heidenrich is here. He's a cardiologist at the VA in here, and this is good work coming from him. So a lot of good work coming out of Stanford on the evidence and how health, health economic outcomes. So we talked about this very briefly, but the common causes, of course, in the United States is gonna be coronary disease, but certainly we have hypertension, valvular disease. If the valves aren't working and closing, you can see that over time, if your leaflet of your mitral valve isn't working, you're always having blood leaking. So again, that's putting more volume and distension and stretching of these of the heart wall. But toxins, medications, cancer, a lot of adriamycin, a lot of cancer drugs are cardiotoxic, and you're actually starting to see here at Stanford uh, clinics that are having niche work between cardiologists that are treating this bridge of cancer patients and working very closely to make sure that those that are treating for cancer were staying on top to try and prevent any heart failure um, down the road. But infections, you can get viral cardiomyopathies, you, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathies, you get virus that attacks the heart and weakens it. Arrhythmia is different and then obviously age related. 
So the pathophysiology of the heart is when you start to have this swollen heart and it gets all this fluid, evolutionary mm -hmm. things in our body, which are really wonderful things, start to take place. You have this sympathetic activation and, and neuroendocrine that the body responds by saying, oh my gosh, I've got all this fluid. So it kicks out um, through the renin angiotensin system, which we don't have to get into, but it's the kidneys to decrease renin, but it makes, um, it, it causes vasoconstriction, renin causes vasoconstriction from the kidneys, mm -hmm. and then again, you're starting to get these signs and symptoms of heart failure. But once you've had an index event, such as a heart attack, you have a scar, the heart goes through a remodeling process. It's trying to heal itself, with, uh, but it remodels, and it remodels to where you really never get that natural function back. So this is what the heart does over time. It just gets stretched and boggy, and then it, it just doesn't work. So you'll see many of these patients that you just have to sleep with two or three pillows at night. They can't lay flat because as that fluid from their legs during the day, because gravity pulls that fluid down, you see all the edema mm -hmm. when there are signs and symptoms of, of um, swelling. But when they lay down, that volume redistributes, and it redistributes to the heavy part of your body, which is gonna be your lungs and, and back area. So they can't breathe. So that's called paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and they have to sleep with like two or three pillows, so it keeps that fluid down. And you'll see them just wheezing, and uh, you'll have pitting edema, and you'll, you'll be able to talk whether it's a mild pitting edema, one, two, three plus pitting edema. Do you really push on that? shin and it stays there and it's really indents and you can see mild to moderate. Um, and when they start to get more advanced, they will have abdominal pain and nausea because the fluid backs up into their liver and then they get ascites in their belly. So their bellies can get really full with fluid. And then it pushes on their stomach so they're, they're just not hungry. They don't, they don't eat much. And then when they have perfusion issues that the blood just is not getting enough to the brain, they get confused and lethargic. And it's a really sad um, thing to watch patients start to suffer down this road. Mm -hmm. So on evaluation, you wanna, are there any exacerbating factors that's brought them in? I mean, are they alcoholics? Because alcohol is a toxin to the heart. Have they had a, a, a binging weekend to where they've had some acute symptoms change? Did they go to a barbecue and have a large salt intake, which then made them hold on to a lot of fluids? So you want to evaluate what's the exacerbating um, causes, and you will look at their vital signs, obviously their volume status, what, what we talked about. We do look at kidney function because the kidneys, again, are important with the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. That's what ACE inhibitors we talked about very briefly. ACE inhibitors block that renin, aldosterone. Um, to, to keep the arteries and veins vasodilated because renin and angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2, which is part of that cascade, are very, very potent vasoconstrictors. So if you have a weak and <coughs> sick heart and it's pumping into a high pressured system, a vasoconstricted system, you can see that that's not good for the heart. You want to relax those arteries so the heart can pump easily into a vasodilated aorta and other arteries. And so you're looking at kidney function to make sure that's good. Brain natriuretic peptide is a new biomarker. This is something you can do and measure. It shows acute, it's um, as, the, the vet, as the atria is distended during this increased volume, it releases this brain natriuretic peptide so you can actually measure that and you can see how acute the heart failure is and then act on it. We didn't have that when I was learning heart failure many years ago, but now this is a wonderful thing. And the higher the brain natriuretic peptide is, um, it's, it's also a sign of increased mortality. So we really wanna watch those. I won't go through this. This is the grading of the evidence and evidence-based medicine. If, um, if, if it's green, Class one, that means there's a lot of trials, a lot of randomized clinical trial data up, out there that you should be doing and treating these patients at the different stages of heart failure. In here is a little bit gray. You don't have total consensus out there with randomized clinical trials on the treatment of patients. And then class threes are harmful. 
And one of the things, an example of that um, is in systolic, and this is very important, in systolic heart failure, where the heart is already reduced and not squeezing, you would never want to treat those patients with a calcium channel blocker. If patients with systolic <laughs> dysfunction are on a calcium channel blocker, that needs to raise some attention to people because what calcium channel, you need calcium inside the cell to have contraction. And if you have a calcium channel blocker, you're blocking calcium in the cell, so you're decreasing contraction. The calcium channel blockers are good vasodilators, they're good for, for blood pressure control, but they're not what you want to use in systolic dysfunction. So calcium channel blockers, bad, bad, bad. But they're good in preserved, preserved um, heart, uh, heart failure because again, you're having that heart that's just pumping really strong. You've got a thickened wall and it's really pumping hard. So getting preserved heart failure to relax a little bit, calcium channel blockers would be a good choice for that. And that's easy to know if your EF is 60 or if your EF is 20. <laughs> But again, that gray area, if your EF's 45, it's really important that you try and determine what that heart failure is. Is it preserved or is it systolic? Because it'll matter how you treat on that. Okay, so this is, um, I won't go into this again. This is the renin angiotensin aldosterone. This is a whole talk within itself. But things such as ACE inhibitors, capipril, enalapril, <coughs> block that. So we don't have vasoconstriction, we have vasodilation. The angiotensin receptor blockers do that too. And uh, the, the mineral corticoid receptor antagonist such as spironolactone has been shown to improve survival in these patients again. So when I told you they're on 10 to 12 drugs, you can see how these drugs start to pile up and you're not on aspirin here, and you're not on diuretics here, they're not listed. But because of the sympathetic nervous system, you have high levels of epinephrine and plasma norepinephrine because those epinephrine levels, they, they are released because it's stress. The heart failure is a stressful situation that your body is not getting and feeling and seeing the blood flow that it needs to. So epinephrine and norepinephrine levels are, are high. And again, those higher levels kill patients. So the higher that level, the higher mortality is for heart failure. So we want to block that as well. And that's where the beta blockers over the last decade to 15 years have really been shown and made a huge impact in these <laughs> patients and survival. And these are the effects of what they, what they have by using them. So this is the RAS system I keep mentioning. Again, that might be something you want to have a lecture on because nephrology and renal could really go into that. But the kidneys are very sensitive to low cardiac output. So when the heart is not uh, squeezing and the kidneys are not seeing that blood flow, there's a whole cascade of things that happen. And angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2. This is what ACE inhibitors block. Angiotensin 2 is converted in the lungs. And it's the most potent vasoconstrictor known to man. This happens in other diseases as well, but this is an important one in heart failure. As I said, it's many people can't tolerate the HACE inhibitors because of cough and side effect of that, and it really is a nagging cough. They cough all the time. Um, spouses complain of it, family members complain of it, and it's obviously upsetting to them. So we can also put them on angiotensin receptor blockers, which are a different um, mechanism of action and how they block, but they have similar effects in that they dilate their arterioles. Um, so that reduces blood pressure, and again, that decreases after load, and that helps the heart. Um, beta blockers are a class of drugs that over the last decade, we've, they block the norepinephrine and epinephrine. There are three types of beta blockers. Beta one is in the heart, always remember that. Beta one, one heart. Beta two are in the lungs, you have two lungs, so beta two receptors are in the lungs. It's a little pearl to remember. And by blocking these receptors, you decrease the workload of the heart, you decrease the heart rate, the contractility, arterial pressure, and overall, that's, that's good. I'm going to skip this for biomarkers. I only do this because you're in clinical research, and again, this is evidence of what C means is consensus. If it's level A evidence, mm -hmm. you should be doing it. 
If it's level C evidence, it's a consensus that most practitioners that would get together and talk about this, you have consensus that you're gonna do a thorough history and physical on the patient. You're never gonna randomize a patient whether they get examined or not. So there's consensus. But level A evidence, such as ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, those are level A evidence and you should be doing that when you're treating these patients. <laughs> So this is reduced ejection fraction. This is just another illustration of how for patients with class two to four, again, you're gonna have the level of evidence is what this means. And I, I put this up here so you, as researchers, you understand what these acronyms uh, are. So CRR would be class of recommendations. LOE is level of evidence. And again, it's showing you through an algorithm the level of evidence of what you should do, how you should be treating these patients based on what their diagnosis is. Now we saw in one trial that African Americans responded differently to different beta blockers and there was a high mortality benefit, benefit in these patients um, living longer if they were treated with hydralazine nitrates, which wasn't seen in Caucasian and other um, subjects in the trial, but African Americans, because of their mechanism of hypertension and the RAS system, hydralazine nitrates are, are really a high benefit and they should be on that when they have heart failure. This is just an illustration that talks <laughs> about that cascade and that progression of heart failure from stage A and what you're going to be doing. Again, I like nice algorithms when I'm teaching patient. It keeps it easy, it keeps it um, organized for me, and I'm a, I'm a bucket person. So the treatments, again, we talked about lifestyle in stage A and stage B, ACE inhibitors and beta blockers for reduced ejection fraction. Um, mm -hmm. We can also have hydralazine isosorbide for the African Americans. And for stage D, again, you're gonna start thinking of palliative care and, and transplant. So, Research shows that in the early 90s that ACE inhibitors had a huge profound impact on how these patients lived. They lived longer, so 28% reduction in death. But when beta blockers came around in the mid 90s, <laughs> on top of 28%, we had an additional 34%. That's huge. When you're talking in myocardial infarction that you have a one or 2% change in how patients are living in the cath lab with an acute MI, Treatment with these meds is having a profound impact on how much longer these patients are living. And then when we looked at um, adding uh, al uh, aldosterone blockers, such as parenolactone, we had an additional 15%. So every time we do a trial, and one of the things that's so wonderful about doing randomized clinical trials is when you have um, um, a protocol that you're working on, you're gonna be on the best standard of ther therapies, best standard of care therapy. And maybe not in places like Stanford, but in community hospitals and other places that are doing research, it really keeps them grounded to what the evidence has shown. If my father was participating in these trials in Mississippi, he would have been on these drugs that have helped him live longer, not the ones we showed. So I, you know, I love clinical research for a number of reasons, not because I think it's, it's, it's the way we learn on how to treat patients, but it also gives patients the best background standard of care therapy. Uh, I show this at just, when I talked about how you have to initiate these doses at very low doses, they come back and see me every two weeks, we take an EKG if they're heart rate was okay, if their blood pressure was okay, we'd, we'd push on. If they were so fatigued and just couldn't do it, we'd wait another two weeks. You don't have to rush, you go slow, you go smart, and you titrate up until you can get to the maximum doses of what they can tolerate, and that will improve their survival. Shows the beta blockers. This is, again, level of evidence. This is class of recommendations, what you're going to do. You're going to re recommend diuretics in patients with reduced heart failure. The level of evidence is a C. Now, why is that level of evidence a C? It's a diuretic. Well, ethically, 
it's hard to randomize a patient to something we know is going to make them feel better. Are you not going to give a patient a diuretic? But we've never randomized to see if diuretics mm -hmm. actually make patients live longer. So we've not done randomized clinical trials, but we know that symptomatology relief, it's important to do. So that's a level, level of evidence C. But we know about ACE inhibitors and um, ARBs, that those are level A's. We've, we've done that research. So um, what's this one? Oh, all those together, uh, class of recommendation, all those together can be harmful, so you have to look at how the patient's tolerating that. Just another illustration of these. So these are uh, different trials that have gone on and showing um, in patients less than 30, in flammable cardiac defibrillators and patients uh, that have ES less than 35%. There's been a number of clinical trials that have shown the control that if you do implantable cardiac defibrillators, that their survival. So these are just the names of different trials and um, what we've done with reduced uh, ejection fractions in patients that <laughs> have had implantable cardiac defibrillators. And if you look at the trials that have been done in patients with preserved EF, this is what we know helps them. We don't have any randomized clinical trial showing survival for that. We don't. We know that we treat them with calcium channel blockers, but there's not been a lot of there of randomized clinical trials to know the evidence there on. So that's quite different when you look at reduced ejection fraction. We've done a lot of work in the 80s and 90s and know the therapies that are beneficial for them. But preserved, it's still a little bit gray and it's out. So this is my last slide. Uh, Evidence-based guideline-directed diagnosis, evaluation, and therapy should be the mainstay of all patients with heart failure. Effective implementation of guideline directed, so best quality, you guys are doing this when you're, when you're gathering your data for your randomized or your clinical trials that you're participating in. It's going to improve the quality of life and preserve healthcare resources. And ongoing research is always needed to answer the remaining questions. I talked about that with HEFPEF. We need a lot, a lot more work to know how we can improve their survival uh, and, and treating them. Any questions? Clear? Mud? Not so clear? Clearer? Clearer? Can you talk a little bit more about um, diagnosis? Um, you know, it's, you talked a lot of, obviously about symptoms and that is hard to diagnosis, but can you talk a little bit more about um, EKGs or echoes or any other imaging? that we use today? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different. So as we said, the number one reason for heart failure is coronary artery disease. So if patients come in with a heart attack, <laughs> they're going to the cath lab, they're getting a catheterization. One of the first things you do when you do a catheterization is you do what's called an LV gram. So you shoot dye into the left ventricle and you can see how it's pumping and you have a nice uh, radiograph to, to show is, is dye staying in there, is dye clearing pretty easily. So LV grams are very helpful and very important. But what if a patient has just diabetes or other um, you know, cardiotoxic such as cancer treating drugs? You, there's many ways to look at that. You can look at echoes. Echoes will show you the wall motion. It'll give you your ejection fractions. It shows if you have a global or if you have a wall motion abnormality that maybe diabetics are having some myocytes die down there, but they're, because they're diabetics, many of them present with a heart attack with no chest pain. Because diabetes don't, you know, you hear about them stubbing their toes and their feet or cutting their legs, because their nerve endings um, aren't as good. They're killed off with diabetes. So many patients with heart attacks that have diabetes will be a silent MI, so they may preserve, um, present with left arm pain or shortness of breath. And an echo can do that. Um, we can have a lot of nuclear medicine scans. Uh, we, we do do treadmills, we do thalliums. Um, what else do we do? CT scans, MRIs, like the rapid CT scans can look at calcium scores to see if you have coronary artery disease for a calcium score. But there are a number of different imaging modalities. Even a simple chest x-ray, if someone has a large heart, you're gonna see a very big, it shouldn't fill up the whole side of the lung. And if it's greater than 50% of your volume of your 
your lung capacity, you're, you're going to be looking at, at multiple reasons. EKGs aren't specific. EKGs don't show you if they're really volume overloaded uh, everywhere. You may see low voltage. They just don't have great spikes because you're not getting good vector electrical um, conduction. But EKGs aren't specific for heart failure. Is that helpful? How about a little explanation of the VO2? Yeah, VO2 max. So that, you could probably explain that better than me being in the clinical realm. But VO2 max is really um, measuring your oxygen capacity as you're exercising or exerting yourself. It's how well your body is able to take that oxygen and use it effectively. And so we talk about VO2 max and exercise capacities where they're breathing um, into an oxygen machine and showing their oxygen exchange from their body's exercise capacity. And VO2 max, we measure that to see how severe their heart failure is. And when VO2 maxes start to really, really drop, you know, we're, we're very concerned about that, that their heart is not effectively and their body isn't effectively using oxygen throughout. Is that, is that helpful? Uh, it's a complicated thing to do. It's not easy to set up. I mean, patients are on bikes and then they have this mask over them and they're trying to exercise. And there's also genetic testing with the cardiomyopathies. <laughs> yes, and to diagnose that, you have to have three generations. Um, so, uh, so cardiomyopathies, you will hear um, the sudden cardiac death or hypertrophic cardiomyopathies. These are the what you get tested on when you have many get echocardiograms to check the thickness of the heart. These are patients that you often hear will be playing basketball and die on the court and they just fall over. Um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathies because of the thickness of the heart. The heart muscle is very irritable. So when you put it under stress of exercise, they go into these arrhythmias and, and it, that's a devastating thing. But then once a patient has that or even has a syncopal episode of exercising, you really do want to look at that and make sure you rule it out. And one of the main things you do when a patient comes in with that is you need to get a very detailed history. Has anyone else in your family ever died suddenly? Do you know anyone that died at a young age and you don't know why? But to get a diagnosis of dilated cardio or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, um, you need to go back three generations, but there are genetic markers to show for that. Could diabetes be a cause of sudden cardiac death? Or if um, someone dies instantly and they have a history of diabetes, it, was that just a massive heart attack and it was probably related to diabetes? It, it definitely could be related to diabetes, but usually in a massive heart attack like that, usually, um, you have this atherosclerotic plaque, and for whatever reason that we still don't understand, the plaque ruptures. And when that plaque mm -hmm. ruptures, it's an injury to the atherosclerotic wall. And so then you have platelets that adhere, platelet aggregation, and then you have that platelet clotting cascade, and so the thrombus gets bigger and bigger. And usually, it's from a plaque rupture when you have massive MI like that. But yes, diabetes can relate to that because it's microvascular disease. There are arteries. My grandfather, they said, died of a sudden diabetic heart attack in his chair. He wasn't exercising. A sudden diabetic heart attack. That's why I was like, yeah, he needs to be, is that really what that was? It, it was many, many years ago. I'm not mm -hmm. but. Yeah, I was just watching this. Yeah, it's certainly a strong risk factor. I mean, it's, it's hard because these patients have pain all the time because their arteries are so small. They're not getting oxygen flow. But when you go in and try, there's nothing to dilate. I mean, you can't, they're just small, tiny vessels. You know, when you go to do um, a stent or something, you have a regular size artery that has a narrowing from the plaque and you open it up. But um, diabetes is very hard to treat because that's why you want to keep them on ACE inhibitors to keep that vasodilation. And we, we know that ACE inhibitors in patients with diabetics live longer because of the preventative mechanisms with the renin. It's, it's, it's not as medical a question, but one of the slides stood out to me and said, you know, cost for treating HF is going up. Is cost for treating what? Treating heart failure is going, going up. up. Is it because we're getting more patients, or is it because we're getting more treatments that are more expensive? Well, it's a, it's not one multitude. It, there's a multitude of reasons. Our patients are, are people in our society are living longer. Mm -hmm. The heart is a muscle, and it gives out over time. 
Um, we are doing better at therapies on getting patients to live longer with cancer therapies. We've shown survival in those, but they have cardiotoxic effects. Um, you treat patients with heart attacks, and but that wall muscle is dead. It doesn't come back, and so over time and that remodeling process, so we are treating them with heart failure. I mean, uh, with heart attacks, and they're living through that acute. But then the more chronic is so. There's a there's a lot of reasons for that. I hit the ER a lot. They come oh, they over and over and over again, and then ups the ups the yeah. cost. That's why keeping them out is yeah. the goal. Yeah, when I was running the heart failure clinic at Duke, I, I had a 24 hour. I mean, my patients weighed themselves every day, and if their if their weight on their scales at home went up two pounds within a 24 hour period we were changing their therapy. Because what happens is once they gain that two pounds, they're already starting to get into fluid overload. And if you don't act on that quickly, that two pounds becomes four pounds and five pounds and six pounds. Then they're getting edematous all over their body, even their gut wall. So you can give them as much Lasix or diuretic as you want, but their gut wall is edematous and so they can't absorb it. And that's why they have to come in and get IV to take that fluid off. So it's really important in heart failure management that you have really constant contact with these patients and you're educating them. They're on low salt diets. When they start getting really fluid overloaded, they're in fluid restricted. They can't take more than a liter and a half of, or two liters of fluid and a day. And they're thirsty these, because of what's happening inside their body with sodium and potassium and, and diuretics, they're thirsty, but you've got to restrict their salt and their water intake. So that you have to, this is, education for this is huge. You spend a lot of time looking at labels and talking to them about their diet, talking to them about alcohol. They really shouldn't be drinking when their heart is weakened like this. It's a toxin as well. Well, thank you guys. It was a pleasure.
one. The, the mm -hmm. file and the heart and the and then they the start going into the compaction and non compaction. Mm -hmm. so I'm taking that size. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's you um, know, when they get restrictive. Oh, or restrictive. And the types of restrictive, and it's based on, yeah, you know, they, 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 single ventricle, she can talk about the pathophysiology of that. So I don't know if this audience would be. Yeah, yeah, but needing that. But um, maybe your group. Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, there's lots of uh, uh, CV medicine um, research coordinators who could probably benefit from that. I don't know, I, I don't think it's widely. Right. Well, let um, me send you an email. Why don't you yeah. talk with them and see if you can get a group of five to 10. She'd be happy to come and talk yeah. to you about. Yeah you know, um, pressure waves and, you know, things that you need to know with the pathophysiology of a single ventricle or yeah. transpositions or tetralogies yeah. that come in. Yeah. She's great Do you see that. a lot of those patients? Well, they only come to us when they're dying, you know. Right. So we, we get them when they're ready for the, right. for the next heart. Yeah. And, uh, and so they come with this, these huge histories. Yeah. And it's a, it's a whole different language and, right. you know, and yeah. they change the terms over time. Yeah. Uh, and the surgeries are changing. I mean, I did, you know, I took care of the, that patient population for four years mm -hmm. in ICU. Yeah. And I went to a presentation this year, and they're already changing some of the surgeries um, from when I was just, I mean, I was clinical, yeah. you know, after clinically was, last year. Right. And, and they're changing in a while. Yeah. It's right. amazing to. Um, well, she'd be happy, happy to do that. that. She'd be happy. So, who? Fernandez? I don't know. She's, yeah. um, she's a PA. Yeah. She's got her doctorate in uh, health policy. But um, she's she's the one working with me on the physician assistant yeah. program here. But she's they brought her from uh, Harvard for to run the, the it's called the Adult Congenital Heart Disease ACHD, mm -hmm. and she's the program director for that. But mm -hmm. she is clinically active, and she's the one that's helping bridge from peds to adult. Uh -huh. yeah. That would be interesting to me. Okay, so I'll, I'll send you an email, and you see she's if you doing get things I don't even know about. Like I could go, you know. Mm, no, I mean, we're teaching right now all the PA students cardiology, but um, she runs the programs helping me with this and then has clinics, so yeah. she's actually quite active, quite yeah. busy. But yeah. if you could get a forum together you think would be helpful, I, I'm happy to yeah. bridge that. And I can talk to Jerry because she, um, she's like putting together, you probably know, um, a group of uh, some of the, the nurse, mm -hmm. uh, the nurses in research, um, since we're kind of in this place yeah. that's needing a, a another level mm. yeah. Yeah. of education. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. ongoing. Yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. for sure. Yeah. She would be great. Yeah. Yeah. She's a wonderful She's a great speaker. Great teacher. She's a well, great thank you so teacher. much. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. It was it was nice, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.
Well, November 1 is the deadline for the application, but because we got approval from the Faculty Senate mm -hmm. so late, um, we didn't get it until May, mm -hmm. so we had to extend our application to GREs longer oh, than yeah. most schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're allowing you to take the GRE, it's on the website, I'm okay. not sure, like awesome. December or awesome. December 15th, but the application's due November 1st. November 1st. Yeah. 
to 75 to 85 percent. So what? You oh, oh, oh! That's from the bridging of yeah. So the bridge it wasn't the EF. It no, wasn't no, the EF. no, no, no. So no, did they do no. it? Um, Mentally invasive. We did. They did. I asked for the same thing. Yes. Like, Should you get a thoracotomy? I know. They, they went through his sternum. We 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 decided to do historic. We actually decided to go with astronomy. First of all, Dr. Hani doesn't do thoracotomy, and we Dr. Boyd does thoracotomy. Uh, yeah. And he um, he's an amazing doctor too, but we had to measure a lot of different things. Yeah, and then he decided to go with the astronaut, which was a great thing because in the end we thought that his uh, bridge was only three millimeters deep. Mm -hmm. Doctor Hadley said that it was nine millimeters deep. Oh wow! Nine. It was super deep. Wow. So, so he, he could have died. Like I just said, he could have. Yeah. Is it just powering off? Good for you. Good mom. That's what the doctor said. You know, usually ask the family. They know better than anyone. You know, we need a day. Just a day. So good for you. I mean, but I'm on my phone. I had a baby. Like, right here, we all had a baby yesterday. I was sitting on the couch. I'm okay. This is burning. Her on your ass. This is not for Jesus Christ. I swear to God. for you. But I was thinking, what can we do to reduce that? What's connected to that? Yeah, it could stay there for a lifetime and never end. Well, if his lifestyle um, is good, it, could, it doesn't just because it's there doesn't mean it will grow. So, but it does have to be away from conscientious. You're not out of diet, and you should be adding it all. Activity and so it's he does to go back to this because I'm good. So lots of couches. Can you close all your eyes? That's great. I did. I just raised. I see. It was a really good story. Bye, Alvi. Bye, Alvi. Bye. It went down ten percent of not using the phone at all in an hour. That's not normal. Look at the look at the Ava. She showed up on my on my knees. When I used to Skype with her when I lived in Amsterdam. Oh my god, look at that hair. Look at her. Look how different her hair looks now. Wait, is that Sienna? Yeah. Oh my Beautiful. god. Her Thank hair you. now is crazy beautiful. It's beautiful, but it is crazy. crazy. It's just so curly and it's mm -hmm. big and poofy. Oh, she's, she's such a sweet really heart. She is pretty. Thank you. Thank you. Really good questions. questions. Yeah, good questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, more, I, I skipped some of these because they're She's wanting more education, and she thinks that understanding the bridging of she she wants to know a higher level. Like she wants to know the pressure wave. She said, "I'm not sure people would be interested right. in like restrictive. Right. It's yeah. really yeah. hard to well, understand." Well, that'll be really advanced for this group. Yeah, but <laughs> certainly look at Sienna's hair in this picture. Oh, <laughs> that was God. at my birthday last year yeah. after her soccer game. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's the first time I met her. Uh, this is my nephew, which is my, my <coughs> brother, or my uncle's sister. So, oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so cute. Yeah. He goes to a private school in San Francisco, so he always goes to school with like, a suit and tie on every morning. I love it. He loves it. It's like his favorite thing. Yeah, thanks for that. I needed it when I was talking, but. Sorry, I should have brought you some. Anyway. You didn't say, hence my mom. She's so smart and pretty. <laughs> She's so smart. Older. God, I'm surprised. I, via 2 Max, I haven't even thought about it. Jesus. Well, you came out of my ass. We did. Yeah. No, I, I, I nailed it. Once I went, I was like, God, I thought about VO2 Max. That's a technical thing to do.
Community Kids Clinic. Machine wants to get in that program. He's very excited about it. He's like, wow, that's everybody exactly. wants to get one. He's like, this is awesome. He's like, oh my gosh, because he's been looking for it. It's 2,000 applicants. That's what they've already done. And another 40 days left. And, and the last two weeks will be floodgated. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Last minute, every day. Yeah. Everybody. How, what percentage of those can you really just go? You're not qualified. Okay. So, of those 2,000, only about 350 have gone through the verification process. They have to be background checked. The transfers yeah. have to be verified. Right. Only 350 so far, and, and who's doing that? Uh, the admissions director. Admissions. But we're on a central application database, so we can filter a lot of that. It's not paper. Uh, no, no, no. I know. No, no, no. Yeah. But still, I mean, it's still you have to go through those applications and, and, and call the application. We can't. And of those 350, there's probably 84 right now that we can just. Okay, no, sorry. Oh. Of the 350, there's 84. So still, I mean, and like you said, you're going to get flooded with more applications. And of those 350, you know, 2,000, I would guess, I guess in the end we'll have about 23, 2,400, and I would guess that 30% of them will just be reaching for the stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Matter of fact, the admissions director got a um, phone call the other day. The man yelling was so upset that we had changed all the rules for the PA, which we have. Um, for the PA school, and he submitted his $50 for the application, and he wants that $50 back because he didn't know he had to take the GRE. And it's on their friggin' website. Yeah, Fred's like, when you punch the button, you should have looked at everything the requirements that's on there, are. And it was on there. So um, Sue's like, I, I have to give the guy the $50 dollars back. I don't really care. But, I mean, yeah. The but thing was like for like this. No, it was to the guy on the phone, and you think you got a chance of getting oh, in when you're abusive okay. like that, or getting your no, money back? Red flag. Bye bye. 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 Red flag. But you know, like, applications are a bitch. You have to look at every little component. Yeah, and we can't just. We have to. Awesome. But we have to look at every applicant too. We can't just say you don't qualify. We have to show that we've gone through. That you've done a lot of work. I'm going to start that this weekend. Who Who was it that? She got 
taught um, just slip-ons, you know, with a wider sole. Um, mm -hmm. I got her a pair of those. I thought um, they were pretty good at Bloomingdale's. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, but nice shoes, not like? Uh, not tennis shoes or anything. Yeah. And then I got her a pair of boots mm -hmm. that, that have a bigger heel, but not real dressy, you know, that she... Nordstrom's or? Uh, Bloomingdale's. We went to Nordstrom's. We didn't see anything there. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, yeah, she, you know, just getting her out. We did her nails. That was nice. when she was a little blue. Yeah, and, nice. Um, she, but every time we suggest, like I said, do you want me to like Catherine, you know, Mary's daughter, that's her age to the game? Mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, I can do that. But she's just not a so. She's not a social. She, she doesn't make, make it happen. happen. You yeah. guys make it happen. Yeah. She We're is very, great if it happens. Yeah. But she's not a make it happen. When I told her, but it's so easy. It's like, you know, dating, you know? If, if you're in a new place, you download one app, and you have 50 friends and people who are making it happen. I mean, you go and just meet for coffee and say, hey, what are you into? Do we have the same hobbies? Are we, do you want to go shopping? Do you want to go get your nails done? Do you want to go exercise? Whatever. With Maria, just yesterday, I really like Maria. We're going to the dip, where she's going to join us to the dish next week. You know, you just kind of, like, put yourself out there. She's, she's not so good at that. Yeah, she's not. But once she gets, she'll be great. Yeah. But she's going to Priory again, and she felt great. She was helping the girls last night. Yeah. She sounds like she's really becoming a coach, too. Oh, really? She said to Anna, she goes, Anna, are you not feeling good? She goes, no, I'm fine. She goes, then why aren't you jumping? Why aren't you going after the ball? Like, they, call her, they call her Coach Mac. Yeah. I, and so she's going to practice, and then she's going in, and then she'll be home. She'll be busy. But I don't know. I, I, I might want to see Kat. Then she's invited this friend who can drink. I mean, she's underage to a football game, but it's her, oh, it's her volleyball, volleyball friend. Volleyball. Who's Catherine? Uh, Mary and Kurt's daughter. Oh, right. She We're the same age. Sweet, sweet, sweet. She's sweet. Okay. And then, um, I forgot what I Oh, so last night she had a foot full of volleyball, and we were at Parkside, and mm -hmm. she went to the bathroom. She comes back. She goes, Shirt to the her first game. I have my 